My name is Andrew Jackson. I'm a geologist with Global Resource Investments and I'm responsible for technical evaluations of the mineral companies and their properties that Global invests in. I put together this Ore Deposits 101 series of talks to help non-technical people understand ore deposits, how they form, how they are explored for, how they are evaluated and mined, and how the metals and minerals are extracted from the ore. The talks highlight some of the features of the main ore deposit types that investors in the resource sector may come across, and it provides an introduction to the jargon you'll find in press releases put out by exploration and mining companies. This is the third talk in the Ore Deposits 101 series, and it focuses on porphyries and iron oxide copper gold deposits, or IOCGs as they are known. These are some of the giants of the ore deposit world. Now in the first Ore Deposits 101 talk, I discussed how, because of our current mining technology, all the metals that we use are mined from the top four kilometers of the Earth's crust. I also showed why with the crustal abundance, or the average crustal abundance of metals, wasn't good enough for economic mining, and that nature needed to provide a major concentration of the metals in, in order to make grades which can be economically mined. You will also remember that nature concentrates the metals by a process of partially melting the crustal rocks at depth and letting them rise through the crust and cool and then dumping the valueless minerals such as felspars and quartz and concentrating the metals in the remaining magma and hydrother hydrothermal fluids. In the second talk in this series, I spoke about the deposits associated with mafic layered complexes and kimberlites. In this talk, I'll focus on the porphyry and IOCG deposits, which develop at a slightly shallower depth than the mafic layered complexes, generally in the range of uh, four or say five to one kilometers depth. Porphyry deposits and IOCGs are the world's primary source of copper and they account for more than 60% of the copper production globally. But in addition to copper, they also supply 100% of the world's molybdenum production, 10-15% to 15 of global uranium production, and a significant proportion of the world's gold production. In short, they make up a critical group of, element, of uh, deposits. So let's start off now with porphyries. Whereas the mafic layered complexes we discussed in the last talk usually developed relatively deep in the Earth's crust, porphyries form at a much shallower depth. Not quite as shallow as epithermal deposits, but not much deeper than them, than them either. Porphyries generally form in and around the magma chambers that feed volcanoes. <clears throat> this is Mount St. Helens, a few years after it's blew its top. Now, seismic surveys show that the main magma chamber extends from 7 kilometers below the surface down to about 12 kilometers below the surface. But the data from the earthquake epicenters shows that there is a smaller magma chamber at a depth of about 2 kilometers, and that is the focus of the seismic activity. It is likely that this upper chamber is where the hydrothermal fluids are collecting and mineralizing surrounding the, rock, the surrounding rocks. Mount St. Helens is a porphyry deposit in the making. The steam you, you can see rising above the new forming dome in the picture the, on the left there uh, is leakage of the mineralizing fluids. When it comes to porphyry deposits, there are a number of variations on a theme in, and the deposits can be copper only, <clears throat> they can be copper gold, copper molybdenum, or molybdenum only. But regardless of the metal mix, the process of porphyry def uh, deposit formation is the same. And let's go through that process. Generally, <clears throat> the parent magma is a product of, the of partial melting of a slab of oceanic crust and sediments. 
and it is subducted beneath a continental margin. The melt rises up through the overriding continental plate and collects in one or more magma chambers and eventually erupts at surface, releasing the pressure and building a volcanic cone. Once the eruption is over, the magma in the neck of the, in the, neck of the volcano solidifies and plugs the vent. The magma then continues to accumulate in the chamber below and it starts to cool. As the magma chamber cools from the contacts inwards, barren feldspars and quartz and crystallize out, and the remaining melt becomes enriched and melts volatiles, eventually, uh, sorry, mainly water, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide. The volatiles migrate to the top of the chamber and accumulate like the foam in a glass of beer analogy that I used in the first Ore Deposits 101 talk. Now feldspar crystals take up more space than feldspar melt, and this, combined with the accumulating steam and gas, builds up pressure inside the chamber until the surrounding rocks can no longer uh, contain it. The cool solid rind to the magma chamber and the country rock above it rupture and the volatiles escape, carrying their metals into the fractured rock. The fluids have a high salt or sodium chloride content, and the metals are generally transported as chloride complexes. As the metal-rich steam makes its way upwards through the cooler rocks, it condenses into brine, and then the metals start to deposit as the temperature drops below about 100, say, 350 degrees centigrade. The metals drop out progressively, starting with copper and molybdenum and then lead and zinc once the temperature drops to below 250 degrees centigrade. If gold is present, it will drop out across the temperature spectrum. Because mineralization relies on this crackling of the carapace around cooling magma chamber, the mineralization is associated with a dense network of fine veinlets rather than a few major veins. Mineralized veins are often only a millimeter or two across, but the grade comes from the high density of veinlets. The host rock is progressively altered by the hydrothermal fluids that pass through it. Initially, the iron and magnesium bearing minerals, such as biotite, amphibi, amphibol and pyroxene, are altered to chlorite, actinolite, epidote and calcite, uh, giving the rock a greenish tinge. <clears throat> this is the propolitic alteration that you hear geologists talking about, and you can see an example of it in the photo on the left of the screen. On the margins of the magma chamber, where large volumes of groundwater pass through the rock, driven by convection and the heat of the intrusion, feldspars break down to sericite mica giving the rock a creamy colour, as in the photo on the top right. This is termed philic alteration. As the alteration progresses further still, more silica and potassium is added to the rock. The chlorite, amphibol and pyroxene that were formed earlier <coughs> are altered to biotite, magnetite, and the plagioclase and orthoclase uh, feldspars are altered to potassium feldspar. This is referred to as potassic alteration and is the best host for the mineralization. In other words, the more altered the rock, the more progressively altered, the better the chance of mineralization. The rock on the bottom right has suffered this potassic alteration. Pink orange uh, mineral is potassium feldspar. The sulfide minerals can't be seen in this photo, but they're generally hosted in those grey siliceous uh, veinlets. These alteration types become important in the exploration for porphyry style mineralization as they provide vectors to the mineralization. This primary mineralizing event yields only low grade mineralization. Grades of 0.3 to 0.9% copper, less than 1% or almost always, are typical for primary grade porphyry mineralization. 
with each pulse and fluid uh, it's tending to enrich the uh, the final grade more pulses of fluid the higher the final grade the mineralization frequently forms a halo around the intrusion <clears throat> both in the intrusion itself and in the surrounding host rocks it's marked in the red hatched pattern uh, in the cross section now although primary min porphyry mineralization generally has pretty modest grades subsequent weathering and erosion of the porphyry may produce high grade secondary deposits of copper just below the water table the oxygen above the water table allows primary copper sulfides such as uh, chalcopyrite to break down to soluble copper salts <clears throat> these percolate down to the water table with the rainwater once they reach the water table oxygen is cut off and the water becomes reduced causing copper sulfide in the form of chalcocyte to be deposited chalcocyte has a higher copper content than chalcopyrite and grades of 5 to 10 percent uh, copper in laterally continuous horizontal beds are not uncommon this secondary enrichment may kick start the production of an otherwise mediocre porphyry deposit following erosion many porphyries are covered by sediments or younger volcanics so how do we explore for a deposit like this which is completely covered by barren younger rocks <clears throat> well let's back up a bit we know that porphyries form under large subduction related volcanoes and that most most of these are located under the ring of fire around the subducting pacific plate another fertile subduction zone occurs in the balkans turkey iran and P pakistan so this gives us a start in deciding where to focus our exploration because of the extensive subduction during the tertiary i.e. in the last 65 million years many porphyry deposits are of this age in other words porphyries are relatively young by geological standards <clears throat> just to put that comment in context although 65 million years sounds a long time ago if the earth's history were compressed into the equivalent of a single year the tertiary would occupy just the last five days of December. So once we focused our exploration on the subduction zones, where porphyries could potentially have developed, we need to find the actual intrusives and their associated mineralization. How do we do that when the mineralization may not actually outcrop? The key to porphyry exploration is the alteration of the surrounding rocks that occurred during the intrusion and mineralization, the so-called propolitic, philic, and potassic alterations I spoke about. Identifying the distribution of alteration allows us to vector into the mild, low-temperature propolitic alteration, <clears throat> and then towards the hotter, more intense potassic alteration that generally hosts the bulk of the mineralization. In porphyry exploration, if you don't see significant alteration, you're probably not close to the close to mineralization, unless the rock postdates the minera mineralizing event. Delineation of the alteration can be done in several ways. Obviously, if the alteration outcrops, straightforward field mapping will identify the telltale alteration minerals, chlorite, calcite, and epidote of propolitic alteration. Quartz, sericite, and pyrite of phyllic alteration, <clears throat> and potassium feldspar, biotite, and magnetite, quartz and base metal sulfides of potassic alteration. There's no proper substitute for getting on the ground and mapping an area in detail, but there are other ways of vectoring in on the most prospective areas prior to expanding this boot leather. And satellite imagery is one of these tools. <coughs> The image is a visible spectrum satellite image of, the porphyry, of a porphyry mine in, in the Chilean Andes. You can see the open pit and the leach pads, as well as the white dust-covered area surrounding the mining operation. Beyond that, you can see the brown and grey volcanics. What you can't see is the mineralization and the alteration of the volcanics. Reprocessing that exact same image for an invisible infrared portion of the spectrum 
shows up this alteration as green for, for the in the case of argillic, or pink or red in potassic alteration. From this you can see that the open pit is pink and purple in colour, reflecting the potassic alteration of the ore. But there's a strong circular area of pink potassic alteration to the north of the existing pit that probably warrants drilling. <clears throat> there are a couple of other small, smaller spectral anomalies that should also be checked out. You can see other pink areas down on the bottom left, uh, for example, and some of these may indeed be potassic alteration, but others are probably false anomal anomalies caused by volcanics that are naturally rich in potassium feldspar, rather than caused by hydrothermal alteration. Satellite imagery, as with most forms of geophysics, usually generates a large number of false anomalies, as well as a few, few real ones. Sorting out the true from the false is largely a matter of experience and then field checking. Satellite imagery works very nicely if the alteration outcrops its surface. But if the porphyry has been partially eroded and then covered by later post-mineralization volcanics or sediments, satellite imagery can't p penetrate below the surface and so it's of limited use. If the alteration isn't within a couple of millimeters of the surface, literally right on surface, the satellite will simply not see it. In this case, we need to use geophysics to penetrate the overlying rocks and see what's hidden below. And there are several geophysical tools that can assist. <clears throat> the quickest way to detect the intrusors is by using airborne magnetic survey. The potassic alteration process generates magnetite and so it may give a positive magnetic anomaly. The image shows uh, the magnetic data over Kinross's Futa del Norte area in Ecuador. <clears throat> the epithermal gold mineralization at the top of the, the image is not detected by the magnetics, except as a break between the blue and the green, which may indicate a fault. However, a blind porphyry intrusion, the camp porphyry on the left of, of the image, stands out clearly on the magnetics. Unfortunately, this, uh, at this stage, this porphyry is too low grade and too deep to be economic. <clears throat> A second geophysical uh, method uh, is induced polarization, or IP. This entails putting short bursts of current into the earth through electrodes and then measuring how long it takes for the signal to dissipate. This signal can, uh, detects disseminated sulfides but not massive sulfides. The shortcomings of the method is that it's generally reliable only down to 250 or 300 meters uh, depth, although some of the newer systems may extend this to about 500 meters deep. If the cover rocks are thicker than that, or weathering has oxidized the sulfides to deeper than this, IP is of little use. A third method, method of geophysics that may possibly be able to detect exposed but not buried alteration is radiometrics. It's usually flown at the same time as a magnetic survey and can detect, can detect radiation from the potassium in potassic alteration. The lower, uh, the lower image is of the Mount Milligan porphyry in, in British Columbia and the potassic alteration stands out clearly on the radiometrics as a high uh, purple magenta blob on the top left. Now all three of these geophysical me methods are indirect, used to detect the alteration and not necessarily the mineralization. We still don't know how much copper, gold or molybdenum the rocks contain and whether they have received enough upgrading from the crustal average to be economically mined. We need to chemical assays to determine this. This may entail straightforward surface sampling if the mineralization outcrops near surface. Stream sediments geochemistry is a cheap method of first pass evaluation. It involves assaying samples taken from stream beds, <coughs> working on the principle that the sediment has been eroded from somewhere in the catchment area of that stream. Samples are usually taken from so-called second-order streams, the ones that drain only a limited catchment area, 
so it's possible to narrow down the source of an anomaly uh, pretty quickly. The image shows the results of one of these surveys, again from Kinross's Fruta del Norte concession. The anomalous red samples identify three catchment areas that warrant further follow-up fieldwork. Stream sediment anomalies <coughs> are usually followed up with a regular grid of soil sampling to identify the source of the stream sediment. Anomalies can be very tightly defined using soil geochemistry and usually well enough to allow you to site a drill, a drill hole. As with almost all ore deposit types, porphyry targets need to be drilled eventually to quantitatively determine actual copper, gold and molybdenum values in the identified mineralization. I'll talk more in detail about drilling and drill techniques in a later presentation. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, porphyry deposits are low grade but generally very large. As a result of the low grade and size, few porphyries can ex support expensive underground mining techniques and most are mined by open pit methods. This picture is of Bingham Canyon in Utah. An aerial shot like this doesn't give a true idea of just how big the pit is and you need to get on the ground to appreciate that. This is a photo from the edge of the pit and you can start to get an idea of the scale from the trucks uh, climbing up the haul roads within the pit. But you only really get a full understanding of scale when you see one of those trucks standing next to a normal SUV. A Cat 797 has wheels 12 feet high and carries a payload of almost 400 tons. The driver probably barely noticed when he drove over this SUV. Everything about porphyry deposits is big. Here are some of the biggest porphyries in the world. You can see that these range in size from 2 billion tons uh, up to Chukikamata at a whopping 16 billion tons. With a pit that is over 800 meters deep or 2,600 feet. Bingham, which I showed a couple of slides back, is a relative baby in this family. <clears throat> Few economic uh, porphyries are smaller than 100 million tons. But although they're big, they're very low grade. Here are some of uh, those same deposits arranged in order uh, according to copper grade. They range from 0.5% copper up to just under 1% copper. Compare those grades to those at Tenki Fungarumi in, in Congo with an average copper equivalent of 5% copper and you can see why they have to, have to be big to make a profit and compete. Tinky Fungarumi is not a porphyry deposit, it's one of the uh, Central African copper belt style of deposits. If you take into account the probable cutoff, you can see how small the margins are. Porphyry deposits are very sensitive to metal prices. These examples are some of the Cadillacs of the ore deposit world, but other lower grade uh, porphyry deposits can become uneconomic with just a 20% drop in copper price. Here are some random drill, drill results from Serengeti's Konica pro property in, in British Columbia, which is more typical of the recent porphyry discoveries. Intercepts with checks against them are potentially economic. The others are probably not. So you can see that maybe uh, only 50% of those intercepts might possibly make any money. Okay, let's have a quick look now at how porphyry ores are treated and the metals extracted. There are two main process streams, one for sulphide ores and the other for um, ore that has been weathered to, uh, to oxidize the sulphides, the so-called so oxide ores. All ore in the pit is drilled and blasted and loaded into trucks and hauled for treatment. If the ore is unoxidized sulphidic ore, then it needs to be crushed and milled to a fine slurry. Then it gets passed through flotation cells in a concentrator to separate and concentrate the sulphides. The top picture shows the interior of a large concentrator, 
with rows of individual flotation cells. The agent, uh, the flotation agent, uh, flotation added, agent, is added to the slurry and stirred. The flotation agent preferably sticks to the sulfides minerals rather than the waste minerals, and then air is bubbled through the mixture, <clears throat> and the flotation agent traps the fine bubbles which carry the sulfides to the surface of the cell, where they're carried over a weir and separated. From there, they're dried to provide a concentrate which then goes on to a smelter. This is the same process for both copper and molybdenum porphyries. The smelter is basically a large furnace which melts co the concentrate and drives off the sulphur to leave molten copper metal. This still contains impurities and it needs to be refined further to make it a saleable project, pro uh, product. Okay, returning to the overall process, that is the process for the sulphide ores and the oxide ores, as I said, are treated differently. Direct from the pit, the oxide ore is piled onto large lined leach pads and sulfuric acid. The top photo shows one of these leach pads with a new thick black uh, plastic liner visible on the right of the pad. The copper oxide minerals are dissolved by the acid to give a blue copper rich solution, mainly of copper sulfate. The solution is tapped off from the bottom of the pad and placed into big tanks with steel plates. An electrical current is passed from the tank uh, to, to the steel, which is then electropated with the pure copper. This process has the advantage of avoiding the smelting and refining stages required for sulfide ores. Okay, I'm now going to move on to a different but closely related group of deposits, the SCARN deposits. SCARNs are formed when hot magma in intrudes limestone. The fluids uh, from the intrusive alter the limestone to form an exoscarn. The intrusive also assimilates the limestone, altering its composition and forming an endoscarn. Either exo or endoscarns may host mineralization. Scarns are often striking looking rocks containing red garnets and green pyroxenes. Grades may be high with splashy looking assays, but they're usually relatively small and irregular in shape and patchy. As, as a result, they are tricky to evaluate by drilling. In addition, the ore tends to be very hard and it has a high work index, so milling costs are high. <clears throat> there are some notable exceptions to the tendency to produce relatively small deposits. These are the Erzberg, Kuchinglaya, and Big Gossen scans developed around Freeport's Grassberg Porphyry in Indonesia. These scan deposits are truly world class, but they are very atypical. These scans are truly amazing deposits. The picture on the left of the slide is the Grassberg pit developed on the Grassberg Porphyry. There are a number of other small intrusions in the area, and several of these have de developed the scans. The picture on the right is of the old abandoned Erzberg pit, the very first one that led to the discovery of the uh, uh, Grassberg complex. The scar, that scan had a high enough grade to allow it to continue to be mined from underground. The Big Gossens copper gold scan deposit is the highest grade to deposit in the Grassberg area. Reserves of 37 million tons at 2.7% copper, 1 gram per ton gold, and 16 uh, grams per ton uh, silver. That's about $240, $250 a ton rock. Grassberg and Erzberg are almost in the equator, but because they're over 12,000 feet in elevation, they receive snow from time to time. There's even a, a nearby permanent glacier. The third and last group of deposits that I'll talk about today are the related iron oxide copper gold deposits or IOCGs. I've clumped IOCGs with porphyries as they are also loosely asso associated with large felsic intrusions and form at moderate depths. Unlike the dominantly tertiary porphyries, IOCGs tend to be much older and are generally proterozoic in age, 
uh, from 1.1 to 1.8 billion years ago. There are some younger ones, but they're in the minority. <coughs> ISAGs tend to form at 4 to 6 kilometers, similar to porphyries, and are invariably associated with uh, crustal scale structures. Crustal scale means that they penetrate well down into the crust, often 20 kilometers deep, and they have strike lengths measured in tens or hundreds of kilometers. The key to the formation of IOCGs is that there has to be an abundance of oxidized groundwater in the country rock to mix with the magmatic water derived from the intrusion. The intrusion of hot water into water-saturated rocks means that the water flashes to steam <coughs> and this fractures the rocks and produces breccias. The high iron content and oxygenated environment means that the alteration is characterized by abundant hem uh, red hematite and black magnetite, both oxides of iron. Where do we find I IOCGs? Well, they're scattered around the world, but because of their co common age, they're usually found in Archean or Proterozoic ter uh, terrains. IOCGs are highly variable in metal content and they range from pure iron deposits such as Carajas in uh, Brazil to predominantly copper uh, deposits such as Candelaria in Chile to copper uranium deposits such as uh, Olympic Dam in South Australia. In truth, IOCG is a bit of a sack term and it covers a multitude of variations on a theme. In size, they vary from the monstrous Karajas at 18 billion tons, 50% bigger than Kuchikamata, uh, which um, uh, was the, is the biggest porphyry in the world, and down to tiny deposits at just a few million tons. Grades of the copper-rich IOCGs are generally low, similar to those of porphyry deposits, in other words, under 1% uh, copper although some may return long intercepts with over 1.5% copper. Chariot's Marcona uh, project in Peru is 347 million tons, grading 0.71% copper. Carapatina in South Australia has some unusually high intercepts such as 178 meters at 1.83 copper, <coughs> but in spite of its relatively high grades, Carapatina is struggling to overcome its depth of burial and the resulting cost of mining. This is a cartoon section through the Olympic Dam IOCG system. You can see the deep intrusive in purple, feeding up through the pink granite basement. The deep magmatic fluids from the source intrusive mix with the oxidized fluids from the overlying green basalts and surface sediments to deposit a variety of copper sulfides. Below the water table, chalcopyrite is deposited along with pyrite. At and above the water table, chalcosite and bornite are deposited. Chalcosite and bornite have a higher percentage copper than chalcopyrite, and this zone at the Paleo water table is the most likely portion of an IOCG deposit to reach economic grades. In South Australia, where both the Olympic Dam and Carapatina are located, grade is a particularly important uh, because of, th of the thick sequence of barren rocks that overlie the deeper mineralization. Olympic Dam is covered by 350 meters of barren material. Fortunately, it was high enough grade to allow Western mining to initially exploit it from underground. Only now, 24 years after beginning operations, are they considering developing a super pit? Similarly, Carapatina is overlaid, overlain by 450 meters of barren material. Its economic viability is in doubt. IOCG ore is often striking to look at, and it is often very red from the hematite content, blue from bornite, or yellow green from various uranium oxides. You can see some of the ores from Olympic Dam in this photo. This awesome looking core, full of bornite and uh, covalite, the blue uh, minerals, is from Monax's Punt Hill property, also in South Australia. 
but in spite of intersections like this which assay almost 50% copper, the deposit is too irregular to allow mining for at a depth of several hundred meters. Exploration for IOCGs can use a number of techniques. Starting with the geophysical methods, magnetics is a very valuable tool, as IOCG systems almost always have a magnetic signature and uh, caused by the abundant magnetite. On this uh, magnetic image, you can see Olympic Dam deposit standing out on reds and magentas. In fact, with careful data collection and sophisticated computer modeling, you can get an idea of the distribution of magnetite in three dimensions, purely from the uh, magnetic uh, survey. The concentration of sulfides <clears throat> means that IOCG deposits are usually denser than the host rocks. And a gravity survey of Monax's property showed a, dis uh, a district-wide gravity anomaly. Uh, and the mineralization, that's the green, the overall greens and yellows. And the mineralization was associated with small second-order anomalies, which have been marked with red arrows, uh, superimposed on the district anomaly. The gravity data of Olympic Dam shows a clear bullseye coincident with the deposit. The presence of massive sulfides also means that electromagnetic or EM surveys can be used to detect buried uh, deposits. If a deposit occurs at surface and it's uranium rich, as in the case of Olymp uh, Olympic Dam, except that that one is buried, then airborne or ground radiometrics will detect the radio radiation given off by the uranium and any associated potassium, potassium alteration. Finally, if the deposit are outcrops at surface, soil and rock geochemistry should detect and define the demineralization in 2D. Drilling will confirm this in the third dimension. So that is a quick summary of porphyries, scarns and IOCG deposits. So what are the key points we need to remember about porphyry scarns and IOCG deposits? Well, firstly, Porphyries and ISCGs are generally very large, but low grade. Scans do not necessarily have the same characteristics. Porphyries and ISCGs are generally fairly homogeneous in grade. There may be some zoning and variation of metal ratios, but over tens of meters, grade tends to be pretty consistent. Scans again do not fit this pattern, and they can vary considerably in grade, just over a few meters. Once you've seen a few porphyries, you've seen them all. The reverse is true of IOCGs, so that each uh, that deposits at each end of the spectrum of IOCGs can be totally unrecognizable as belonging to the same group of deposits. Porphyries, scans, and IOCG deposits very often have both oxidized and unoxidized portions. <clears throat> this is important as it impacts on capital costs. Capital costs for building up uh, porphyry and IOCG mines are generally high compared to other deposit types. This is due to the combination of multiple ore streams and the huge size and throughput needed. Finally, geophysics plays a crucial role in exploration for each of these deposits. So that's the end of this talk on porphyries and IOCG deposits. The next talk in the uh, Ore Deposits 101 series will focus mainly on mesothermal veins. This group includes one of my favorite ore deposit types, greenstone belt uh, gold deposits, which provide a significant portion of the world's gold resources.